How many of you have ever heard someone in a more conservative or evangelical space some, say something to the effect of Jesus was either a liar, a lunatic, or the Lord? Have any of you ever heard that before? Just a few of you. Okay. Well, this is a common refrain from a more conservative point of view about basically it's a critique of the a non-literalist interpretation of Jesus. Because when they read scripture, they see Jesus say things, especially in the gospel of John, I am the way, the truth, and the life. None can come to the father except those that come through me, right? That not a single thing was created before except through him. That he is the light of the world, right? And these concepts, if they were spoken by an ordinary and average human, then this person is either a liar who's just making stuff up or they don't have really a solid grasp on reality or they really are Lord of the universe, right? And those are your three choices, right? It's either demonic, dumb, or by design. And the gift that Borg is giving us is he's giving us an interpretive lens to say, that's not the only way to read scripture. That's not the only way to understand what's happening in these texts, what's happening in our Christian life, what's happening as followers of Jesus. So I just want to say to you that we can think about this distinction, the distinction between the pre-Easter Jesus and the post-Easter Jesus to give us a way in. And the thing I've been thinking a lot about this is that the pre-Easter Jesus is the one that educates us, but the post-Easter Jesus is the one that liberates us. The Jesus of the earth, the human Jesus, is the one who enlightens us, but it is the post-Easter Jesus, the cosmic Jesus, the, God, the Jesus that was known in the spirits of his disciples. That's the Jesus that enlivens us. And sometimes because we are, as a progressive church, a little bit hesitant and anxious about claiming to know the mind, will, and vision of God, we lean a little strong into the pre-Easter Jesus and we lose not just the cosmic divinity, but we lose the personal connection and relationship to Jesus. Now, I know many of you, and so I know many of you have struggled in various ways around this idea of even having a personal relationship with Jesus, that, that even that concept feels foreign and uncomfortable and maybe even a little bit like too much. But I want to say that when we look at the idea of the pre and post Easter Jesus, what we're looking at is we're looking at the experience of the person. And then we're looking at the experience of how his personhood has resonated and changed and transformed us through the centuries, how the church has experienced miraculous events and breakthroughs and understandings, how the hardest hearts have been melted. And so I think about these, these people ready, they're ready to throw Jesus off a cliff. Why? Why? Because he says he dares to pick up the scroll of Isaiah and say that this reading is fulfilled in your hearing, that the captives shall be set free, that the oppressed shall be liberated, the blind shall see. And he goes on to say, and it might not happen to you. It might not happen here. In fact, it's not owed to you. It's not something that you could earn or deserve. It is the will of God to do these things, and God will do them everywhere. And the question is not whether we heard the word of Isaiah being spoken. The question is, did we feel the word of Isaiah being fulfilled? Did we feel the possibility of liberation in the words of Jesus? Have you, have we felt the possibility of real freedom in the words of Jesus and in the encounter with the living Christ in our lives. See, I would argue that the world is at a tipping point. Now, I don't mean to say that uh, the world is on the verge of apocalypse, 
because the world is always on the verge of apocalypse. When every one of you was children, people believed that the end of the world was right around the corner, right? Either active global war for some of you or possible nuclear holocaust for others of you or global environmental crisis for everybody now, right? No matter when you grew up, we were always right on the edge of the end of the world. And every generation has believed that it is on the edge of the end of the world, every single generation through history. But I mean something different. I mean that the world is at a tipping point because we can now, more than ever before, center the people that are most dramatically negatively impacted by our behavior. We now, more than ever before, can actually know the consequences of our actions. We can know the consequences of global trade. We can know the consequences of deforestation. We can know the consequences of eco ecological harm. We can know the consequences of technological development. We can know those things in a way we could never know them before. The world is so much more interconnected now than it has ever been. And it is only increasing in possibility. Think about how many relationships you have now that are active and alive in your life people that live hundreds of miles away from you. Think about how much bigger your world is now than your grandparents could have possibly imagined. And the same is going to be true in orders of magnitude as we go forward, as time continues to progress. We can know about the harm in the world in ways that we never could before, which means that we can also course correct in ways that we never could before. We can turn around. We can change our minds. To use a biblical word, we can repent in ways that just have never been possible before. But the only way we're going to be able to do that is if we can do it without shame. The only way we're really going to take seriously and center those who are most affected in the world is if we can get out of our own way. Now, I talk about this in all kinds of contexts. It comes up a lot in anti-racist work as a white person because so many white people are so anxious about doing it wrong, about being part of racial justice work, but screwing it up and hurting people. And so we just kind of opt out, right? And I've been consulting with a number of other folks and talking to them about, you know, what's at the center of the concern about that is a lack of trust in the God of grace and a belief that what we really need is we need to do it right. We need to be good, we need to be worthy, we need to earn our righteousness. And what I encounter in the post-Easter Jesus is a Jesus who says, you, yes, you, you are beloved of God. There is nothing you could ever do, say, think, feel, imagine, or believe which could ever separate you from the love of God. It is yours forever. And that doesn't mean that you're good. And it doesn't mean that you're right. And it doesn't mean you have it figured out. It just means that no matter what happens, you're always welcome back. And Richard Rohr talks about how that is really what changes us. That is really what transforms us. Not being convicted that we were wrong, but being loved in being wrong. Not realizing that we've done harm, but knowing that we are still beloved even in that harm. Because in so doing, we have the ability to grow our capacity to love that person who's harmed, love that thing that's broken, love that space where we screwed up and be called in rather than being called out. So much of modern culture is, I think, missing the point of this tipping point. So much of modern culture is moving towards this call out and naming how people are screwing it up in this aha, gotcha move, where in reality, the opportunity, the faithful opportunity, the Jesus opportunity is to call people in and say, hey, do you see? We can see and we could change. But the only way that that's ever going to be possible is if we are ready and willing not only to believe that we are beloved, but then to honestly confront the places where we believe some are worthy and some aren't. And when Jesus preached in that synagogue and he said, look, there were plenty of lepers in Israel 
but the only one that was cleansed was Naaman, the Syrian, the non-Israel. There were plenty of widows in Israel, but the only one that was cared for was the widow of Zarephath in Sidon. Those are people that are not worthy. Those are people that are not in. Those are not the chosen people of God. How dare you tell me that they deserve mercy? We could all use a little mercy now. And it is the power of the post-Easter Jesus that confronts us and convicts us that we are the ones who have limited God's mercy. We are the ones who have limited God's love. We are the ones who have decided who's in and who's out, not God. It is the post-Easter Jesus that liberates us from guilt. It is also the post-Easter Jesus that through love transforms us, transforms us for love, transforms us in love, transforms us as love. It is the post-Easter Jesus that makes possible our liberation, that then makes possible our participation in the liberation with others for love. So the question is, do you know the post-Easter Jesus? Do you know the transforming and powerful living Christ? Have you heard the word of Isaiah and have you felt it? And how can we be people who lean in to that Jesus? How can we be people who start investing in Jesus's vision of God and what our community is called to be?